But now I want to move your heart because we have a special guest with us today. We have a guest who will inspire each one of us in this room today. Inspire us because you will learn from her story how incredibly powerful you are. How incredibly powerful your actions affect other people. You're going to hear a story where people she met moved her. And they weren't dying, they weren't preachers, they didn't give her a book to read, they didn't do, you know, comparative religion. They treated her with Gaddafi, class, with Hickman. And today we have Sister Lauren Booth, a journalist, a broadcaster. She currently presents two programs on Palestinian issues. One is called Remember Palestine, the other one is the Diaspora. Lawrence visited the West Bank and Gaza as a journalist and an activist, and as a result, she accepted Islam in 
but she would buy crosses and hang them all around the house to ward off evil spirits. Now my grandmother uh, did teach me to pray. She taught me the Lord's Prayer, and I used to say that at bedtime. But it, the feeling inside me was stronger than just words taught to me by my grandmother. It's hard to describe. It's just a memory of being five and six years old and knowing that I personally, as a child, loved to put my hands together and say the words, Dear God, and then come out with a list of asks. Because I believed so strongly, I understood so strongly that the power in my house was uh, my father, my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, and above them all was God making all the decisions for all of us. It was common sense. When did we lose that common sense? Allah tells us in the Quran that we have fitrah, belief, knowledge of God that he puts into us in the wombs of our mother. Well, I can relate to that. Because I remember having absolute certainty and knowledge of God when I was little, even in the family. Uh, where the belief was in practice. But we grow up in a Western secular environment and it's really, really hard to hold on to that rope of belief. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it a rope, the rope of Iman. He says, hold on tight. Hold on tight to that link to God. Well, what happens is we slide off. When I was 10 years old, I remember that I'd go to bed praying and then Gradually, friends come over and you have sleepovers, right? So I remember a friend coming over from school. She stayed the night. At bedtime, I put my hands together. Dear God, please. And she looked at me like I was crazy. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying to God, of course. She said, what? Santa Claus, the guy with the big beard on the cloud. You believe in invisible, invisible beings just made me feel like I was being mocked. Maybe I was crazy. Everything crumbled. Without any practice, without any teaching, without anything to hold on to, my faith just wore away. And then, of course, what happens is you get to be 11, 12, and 13, and two things happen simultaneously. First of all, your, um, your hormones kick in. Your hormones kick in. And then um, your arrogance and the ego. You could say the nafs kick in. So I remember very much going from a humble child into I run the world and I miss everything. <laughs> and I was like that for about 30 years, embarrassing me. <laughs> the longest teenage life ever. <laughs> so holding on to the rope of Iman is really pretty difficult. And what did I know about Islam growing up in North London in the 70s and 80s? Well, I went to an all-girls school, and in my year were around three Muslim girls. And so, over the next six years, I watched them from a distance. We never sat together. They had their own clique going on. I was doing something different. But I observed, and if you'd have asked me about Islam, I would have said, yeah, I know about Islam. I know three things about Islam. And you'd say, well, what, what do you know about Islam? I'd say, number one, Islam means that Muslim girls have to grow their hair down to their waists. Secondly, Islam means that Muslim girls are really good at maths. And Islam means that Muslim girls are all going to be doctors and it comes from Pakistan. <laughs> now, up until 9-11, that was, I'm really embarrassed to say, all that I thought I knew about Islam. And you can see judge how much of that was wrong or right. I would be more embarrassed about that if that wasn't actually probably two things more than most of America still knows about actually. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you. When you are a revert, it's warming for everybody to know the moment that the person felt that fitra return or that light come into the heart. And so people would begin to ask me two years ago, what happened? When did it happen? When did you first think there's something more out there than this shell and this, this need, this pair of shoes, this, this next thing? And I thought really hard about it. And, and I, found, I found the moment. And I'll, I'll tell you about it now. 
In the year 2000, I had a newborn baby called Alexandra. She was a month old. And I was sitting in front of the TV one night. And an image came onto the screen that stopped. It stopped the world for me. And it took the breath out of my body all at once. And I'll describe it for you. All I could see on the screen was the back of a young boy. It was on the evening news. And that young boy, 15 years old, had a stone in his right hand. And he was standing like this with the stone. But his head was up and his back was mighty. And what was amazing was that just a few feet from him was a tank. And the tank was pointing its gun right at him. And this boy had a stone. And I'll tell you what, that stone was mightier than that tank. Stop me. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't ever want to stop seeing that image. In fact, if I close my eyes, I can see it precisely now, even down to the jeans the boy was wearing. Now, that tank was an Israeli tank. And that young boy was 15 years old, and his name was Faris Odeh. And he came from a place I'd never heard of, called the Gaza Strip, in a country I think I'd heard of called Palestine. I didn't know this at the time, but 15 days, nine days, sorry, after I first saw that image, Faris Oded, 15-year-old boy with a stone, was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. He was shot in the neck, and he died on the floor of his refugee camp, and the world didn't mourn or stop, not for a second. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you, you can go to the left, you can go to the right, you can make mistakes, but you will be guided to that path. It's just how difficult you make it getting there. And so that's the only explanation I have for what happened next in my life. Because in 2005, I was a mainstream journalist. I had a column in a newspaper called The Mail on Sunday, which was read between... 2 million and 4 million people every weekend. I was writing about living in France. I had a villa in France. I had a swimming pool. I had two daughters. Life was sweet. And I didn't need anything. I was also at the height of my arrogance. But somehow, for a reason that, wallahi, I have no explanation for. In January 2005, I marched into my editor's office. And I promise you, it was like I was having an out-of-body experience because I couldn't believe the words I was saying because I said, I'd like to go to Palestine, Peter, and cover the Palestinian elections about to take place. Now, Peter Wright is a very clever guy. He's one of the best editors in what we call Fleet Street. He should have said to me, Lauren, it'd be ridiculous. You're not a war correspondent. Go back to writing about hairstyles. For goodness sake, go back to writing about living in the south of France. Off you go. And I would have gone. But that's not what happened. Peter looked at me. He said, all right, go to Palestine. Here's the money. I'll give you four pages in the magazine. See you in two weeks. A few days later, there I was, outside Tel Aviv airport. I didn't have even a suitcase, because the Israelis had kept my suitcase for extra security checks. I had three phone numbers with Palestinian names on them I'd never met, and I had no idea what was going to happen next. As I stood there wondering what on earth to do, how you get from Tel Aviv to Palestine, a man came up to me and he introduced himself like this. Hi, my name is Jamal. You can call me Jimmy. I said, hi Jimmy. He said, I'm a taxi driver, where do you want to go? I looked at the piece of paper. I'd like to go to a place called Ramallah. Do you know it? He said, sure, sure. Get in the car, I'll take you there. Over the next hour, hour and a half, Jimmy Jamal gave me 63 years of Palestinian history. That's nearly a year a minute. It was a really great lecture. It was Occupation 101, and I learned a lot. We got through Jerusalem, Al-Quds. We went on the roads towards Ramallah, section area C, it's called, of the Palestinian uh, occupied lands, towards the West Bank, of the West Bank. And as we got closer, the road got less and less like a motorway, more like a, a bit uh, full of rocks and 
not so illustrious. And I said to Jimmy, why don't we use that road on the uh, mountain? It's going the same way and it's empty and it's a good motorway. I remember he just looked at me and said, you don't know much about this, do you? I said, tell me. He said, that road up there is for Jews only. If I go up there with you in this car, we'll be shot dead in around six minutes. Shall we go? <laughs> yeah, well, a good sense of humor. I think it's been around death so much. And he did this. I went, no, I don't want to go on that road. He said, and the joke's on me because I'm from Jerusalem. I'm a Palestinian from Jerusalem. So my taxes go to pay for the Jews only roads that I can't use unless I'm going to be shot. And a single word came into my head. Apartheid. That was all. Just apartheid. Jimmy took me to the first checkpoint I'd ever seen. It was by now dusk and I was on my own. And when he asked me to get out of the car and said goodbye, I said, what do you mean goodbye? T please take me to my hotel. Don't just dump me. He said, you don't know much about this, do you? I said, tell me. He said, I can't go to the West Bank. The Israelis have given me an ID for Jerusalem. I can never ever visit Gaza and I can't go to the West Bank. You have to walk through on your own and get a different taxi. Apartheid. In the morning, the next day I woke up. I had somehow, with a couple of phone calls, the numbers that I'd been given, secured an interview with Mahmoud Abbas, who was about to become president of the Palestinian Authority, on the day he was elected, I mean, it was a major scoop for any journalist. There were journalists, war journalists and correspondents from around the world. And me, writing about hairstyles and living in the south of France, gets to me. It was amazing. Now, when you meet a world leader, especially on election day, you have to uh, negotiate with their security. Now, remember, <coughs> I'd never been to an Arab country. I didn't, at that point, know any Muslims. I'd certainly never been to the Middle East. And I was on my own with Mahmoud Abbas's personal security guards. These were two of the biggest Arabs you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> six foot five and six foot eight. Both of them with guns. Walkie talkies. Camouflage pants. It was like in a movie. They, got, they put me into this metal container that was an elevator. Uh, before that, they took my bag. I'd take your bag take your phone, take your coat. I was standing there on my own. And I remember really well one of the walkie-talkies on the men's belts when he took it out and he said something like this, Come back, but no, but no, yeah, maybe, but for inshallah. I'm really sorry, that is how Arabic sounds to English people. <laughs> and I thought immediately, subtitle, we'll kill the white woman later. <laughs> because I realized that I had Arabophobia. In the back of my mind all the time since I'd arrived in Palestine that first 24 hours was the fact that who was going to be the one who kidnapped me? Who was going to be the crazy with the gun? Was I going to end up in some horrible YouTube video on Al Jazeera? It was on my mind. I was racist. I'd absorbed all of those negative images without ever having met a Muslim or a Palestinian in their homeland. Now they say that politics, a week is a long time in politics. Well, I can tell you today, three days, it's a life-changing amount of time in Palestine. Because just three days later, I went from being scared of every Palestinian man that I met to loving every person that I met. And I knew that I'd give my life for any man, woman, or child after just three days in Palestine. Such was the love and kindness that they showed me as a stranger. I'll give you an example. Remember I had my um, suitcase with the Israeli security. I was going to tell you about a phone call there from Israeli security, but it's not relevant. Really nice. um, yeah, they kept, so they kept my case. And I was walking along uh, a street in Ramallah, and it was cold, it was January, it was rainy and drizzly. 
And an old lady just came up to me. She looked at me like I was crazy. And she grabbed my arm and said, yalla, yalla, yalla. <laughs> Which means basically, come on, come here. And she took me into her little home. And she ushered me into a bedroom and opened a cupboard. And she took out a big coat and she put it on me. Then she found a little case and she put some jumpers in. And she closed the case and gave me the case. She wrote down what I presume was her name and number because it was in Arabic, I didn't understand it. She showed me to her door and she said, Salam alaikum. Mm -hmm. So what is this? What is this? What sort of people do that? You see a stranger on the street, you give them a coat and you give them a case of clothes, you say goodbye. It was remarkable. And stuff like that happened on every single day of that trip. And it changed my life and it changed my heart. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tell you something, wants to show you something, no matter how stubborn you are, you will start to see it. That was in 2005. I went back in 2006 to write another article. And this time, I got my first Quran in English. Would you like to hear how I got that Quran? Well, I was walking in Jerusalem. The day after leaving the Gaza Strip, I'd gone to Gaza for the first time. And I can't tell you about that trip. It was so difficult what I saw with the occupation forces that I was traumatized. Let's just say I was traumatized. And I was in the streets, Jerusalem, and it was raining, and I had 40 minutes before my flight, and I was stressed. I had a long <coughs> list of things to get for my kids. And a young Palestinian man got into step with me, and he said, Marhaba! Like this. And you know when you're stressed and angry, you can be a not very nice person. So I was like, yeah, yeah, mahaba, whatever. <laughs> and a voice in my head, my head said, don't you dare ever be rude to a Palestinian in their land. Because they have made you welcome everywhere. You just check yourself. So I took a breath. I said, sorry, how are you? He said, I'm fine. What can I do for you today? <laughs> That's Italian. It's definitely not a Palestinian accent. Okay, he wasn't Italian, he was Palestinian. Um, I said, look, I've got this long list of souvenirs that I need to buy for people, and I don't know where to get them. He said, this is great news. All of the men in these stalls are my uncles. We shall help you. <laughs> I read out my list. It was two stuffed toy camels for my daughters, a mother of pearl photograph of Yasser Arafat, a ceremonial knife for my husband who collected knives and maybe a Quran in English because I wanted to see what all the fuss was about by now. In the next 40 minutes we dived in and out of beautiful souk stalls in the uh, ancient uh, roads of Al Quds. We drank so much mint tea I think I got diabetes. <laughs> Seriously that tea is too sweet. 40 minutes later we're back outside in the streets. I have bags full of all of those gifts and many more things. And I turned to this young man, who by the way, I've never seen before and I've never seen again. And I said to him, how much do I owe you? And he looked at me and said, you don't owe me anything. These are a gift from the people of Palestine to you. Don't forget us when you go. That's how I got my first Quran, as a gift from the people of Palestine to a stranger who meant them no harm. Alhamdulillah. Now, I still wasn't on the road to Islam, I promise you. I was a happy sinner. In fact, I don't know anybody who was a happier sinner than I was. <laughs> I was not seeking spiritual enlightenment. I wasn't reading any books. But if Allah has a plan for you, you will still get dawah. So I wasn't going to any lectures, I wasn't looking at Islam, I was just doing my job and I was interested in uh, freedom for Palestine. But I was getting dawah. And I was getting dawah from one specific place. Somalian taxi drivers. May God bless Somalian taxi drivers. <laughs> they are the invisible army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because every time I got into a taxi cab, and I used to use them all the time, being having an expense account, I used to get in, I'd say salam, because I'd been to Palestine, they'd say, salam alaikum. As the Prophet said to his wife, Aisha, da 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 
And there would begin a lecture that would go on as long as the journey lasted. I would get Quran, Hadith, Sunnah, beautiful stories that made my heart melt. And you know what, after a few months of this, I started to think this guy, Muhammad, sounded really great. Every, it began actually that when I heard his name, my heart felt like it was actually growing in my chest. I felt such love for him, I thought, and I would ask, tell me more about Prophet Muhammad. And of course they would. Now it's interesting, today I still sometimes get into taxis in North London, and yes, they are still driven by Somalians most of the time. And I say, because I'm a sister now, Salam Alaikum. And they all say the same thing to me, the exactly same thing, it's a question. I say assalamu alaikum, they say, are you married? <laughs> <laughs> no more Quran or Hadith, by the way. But somebody uh, have to explain that to me. <laughs> when Allah has a plan for you, you have to stick to that plan, no matter how far you go to the left and the right of it. So like I say, I was still not on a journey to Islam. I was just becoming an activist for uh, Palestinian freedom. And so imagine my surprise when I got a phone call when I was on a visit to London from a man called Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali runs a channel called the Islam Channel. And he said he'd like to have a meeting with me, which I thought was curious. Because I worked for the mainstream, I worked for a newspaper that was far from friendly to Muslims, and I didn't even know how he'd heard my name. There we go, and Allah has a plan for you, and he has a plan. I went to have a lunchtime meeting with Muhammad Ali and his head of programming. Now I want to give you some insight into who I was at the time. The arrogance and the hardness that was inside me. Muhammad Ali came to sit down at the table. I sat down at the table. He has a beard quite a long beard, down to here. In Gaza terms, in Gaza we call them serious beardies. I guess you have to be Palestinian to get that one. He was a serious beardy, and he sat down and I did this. Yeah, waiter, can we get a bottle of wine, please? Because I didn't care that he was religious. I mean, being Muslim is your problem. I'm out for lunch, and at lunch, I like to get drunk. If you're having lunch with me, deal with it. You can be in my country. You can be in my country. <laughs> Don't mind your little Muslim thing going on. But you sitting at my table, I'll do what I want. That's who I was. 2007. Now, Muhammad Ali is a very smart man. He's got a wicked sense of humor as well. He's a very smart man. So he looked at me and he waited for me to, uh, to get the glass of wine. And then he said, then he sat and he said, there are two things I have to say at this point. I said, go on. He said, what? The Islam channel is not buying your wine. <laughs> he said, number two, I'm not sitting here while you drink your wine. Now, he could have gone to sit at another table. That would have been within the remit. You can be at another table. There's someone known what non-Muslim sits. Okay. But he didn't. He went outside the restaurant, stood in the windy road, looking at me like this. <laughs> waiting for me to drink the wine on my own. And a strange thing happened, because for the first time since I was a child, I felt, it was a weird feeling, shame. I felt ashamed of myself. Why had I been so rude to a man of faith? Was I one of those people who was a hater? Why was I so obsessed with getting drunk that I would disrespect somebody I didn't even know, somebody who'd been polite to me? What sort of person was I? I got rid of the wine, and I said, you can come in now. I think my cheeks even flushed a bit. Now he sat down and he said the most amazing thing, and then one day I'll ask him, why did you say that after the wine incident? He said, we'd like to offer you a job at the Islam channel. This was my face. I said, you're sure? He said, sure, we're sure. I said, you know I'm not Muslim. He said, yeah, I guessed. 
Now, in my arrogance, I said two things. I have two conditions before I join the Islam channel. One is, please don't try and make me Muslim. Don't try and indoctrinate me or talk to me about Islam because I'm never going to be Muslim, okay? He said, Allah knows whether you will be Muslim or not and you do not know. <laughs> I said, Oh, okay. <laughs> so he said... No, no, it's the clock. It's the clock. It's the clock. It's the clock. We have that. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I'm sorry. I was so quick to use this. So, inshallah, we'll need to ask her that three things, inshallah. Okay, I'm happy with that. So, I said, um, don't talk to me about Islam because I'm not going to be Muslim. And he said, Allah knows and you don't know. And I said, I know and your God doesn't know. He said, God knows, you don't know. I said, I know. He said, okay. <laughs> and I said, the second thing is, I'm not going to be wearing hijab on your channel. Because I will never, ever, ever, ever wear hijab. <laughs> now, you might remember a certain ship. It was called the Titanic. That was the ship that was never, ever, ever going to sink. There is a reminder here. Don't say things definitively. Don't say, I will be there. I'm going to do this tomorrow. You say, inshallah, no willing. Because the rest, if you don't do that, is arrogance. Because you're not making the decisions. So, how did it turn out me not being Muslim and wearing hijab? He gave me a job that meant that I traveled the world for the next two years interviewing some of the great clerics, minds, academics and activists in the Muslim world today. And you have to be moved and changed by that. One of the men who most moved my heart is a man called Sheikh Riyad Salah. Riyad Salah is known as the Lion of Palestine. He is the leader of the Islamic movement in northern Israel, and one of the guardians of al Aqsa Mosque. Now, I was interviewing him in the foyer of a hotel at midnight after a Copenhagen conference on political prisoners. And Sheikh Riyad Salah walked up to me like this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I thought, this is the Lion of Palestine? <laughs> Where's his rule? Because I had no concept at the time that humility can have its own power, or humbleness is dignity, or quietness is strength. He sat opposite me and he never looked me fully in the face. His eyes would flick up, then he'd look down. Now as a Western journalist, you're indoctrinated, not deliberately, maybe not deliberately, but just by what you absorb, to somehow think that if an Arab man a Muslim doesn't look you in the face. If he doesn't look you in the face, it's because you make him sick. Because one, he's a misogynist, clearly he hates women. Because Muslim men hate women and want to beat them. <laughs> Two, because you're white and you're not Muslim, so you're a Kafir. And he thinks you're evil. But you know what? When Sheikh Riyad Salah sat there, not quite looking me in the face, face I just thought, what a lovely, humble, peaceful man. I didn't think, I didn't feel hate from him. I felt respected. And I also felt that his spirit and his mind were only 5% in the room and 95% somewhere else. And I'll tell you what, I wanted to be wherever that somewhere else was. Because the, he was giving off waves of peace. And I know now the name for it, it's Iman. Sheikh Riyad Salah had Iman. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you, you may go to the left or the right, but you will still go in the direction of that plan. It's now 2008, and I'm back in France. I've now got two daughters. I'm a very successful journalist, and I'm still not on the path to Islam. And I get an email. And this email is only two lines long, and it changed my life forever. And the email read this. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat? If so, call this number. I looked at it and thought, that is insane. 
Who sent me this email? I didn't recognize the sender. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. Now in 2008, I was aware as a journalist and as a beginning activist that Gaza was under siege. That 1.8 million people were being systematically denied their right of freedom to breathe, travel, leave their place of uh, their, their nation and come back to it. The goods were not being allowed in. I want you to understand something here. What does the blockade mean? This week, several fishermen have again been shot over the last couple of weeks, actually, by Israel. And their new, brand new boat. Gaza and fishermen had a brand new boat. We're talking life savings were just taken by the Israeli Navy. Now, how far was he from the shore in Gaza? Three nautical miles. Now, under the Oslo Accords, the Gazans can fish 23 nautical miles, but in truth, they never get past three without being gunned down. And uh, when they spray the boats, the Israeli Navy, they use toxins that smell like cattle dung. They make you very sick. And then they tell the men to strip off and get into the ICC, swim to their boats where they're beaten and they're taken into custody. That's if they're not shot. That's what a siege means. You can't go anywhere by sea. There's errors here. No man or woman under 50, 45, 50 is allowed to go that way into the rest of Palestine. And you've got the Rafa crossing here and the rest is razor wire. They've got no air service, no train service, and no roads to the rest of the world. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat and call this number? I called the number, I couldn't resist. And I remember a voice answered and said, hello, this is Osama. I thought, blimey. <laughs> I do not want to go to Gaza by boat with Osama. <laughs> it would be a really bad career move. Alhamdulillah, it was a different Osama. <laughs> and I found myself going into my editor's office again and saying, Peter, I want to go to Gaza by boat. Peter said, here's the money, come back in two weeks, we'll give you four pages of the magazine. And I remember standing outside his office going, does he just want to get rid of me? <laughs> In August 2008, I took a plane to Cyprus and I joined 45 of the best human beings I've ever had the honour and the privilege of meeting in my life. And none of them were Muslim. A lot of them actually were ladies in their 50s, 60s and 70s from your area, from Los Angeles. That's how Free Gaza started. And the lady called Greta Berlin, and other students, and activists, and nurses, and doctors, all kinds of human beings joining together to get on two of the worst fishing boats you've ever seen in your life to try and get to Gaza so that people would see that it was wrong to put a siege on 800,000 children and 1.2 million adults. I remember the day that we were going to leave. We had frogmen from the Cypriot um, port authority go under our boats to check for Israeli explosives. It was a very dangerous, not funny thing to do. We all were told to write our wills. We all left messages for our family. I was the only person to have young children at the time. And I cried a lot when I left the message. We got on the boats and we set sail. In the middle of the night, I was awake and a young girl called Jenny was driving briefly, she was captain briefly, and the radio came on and a message came through the darkness of the night and it was this. Free Gaza, free Gaza, free Gaza, this is the Israeli Navy. This is the Israeli Navy to free Gaza. Turn back now or you will be stopped. This is your only warning. I promise you, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. My heart all but froze in my chest. Then, Hebrew music started to come out of our emergency radio. I turned to Jenny, who's like this tall. I said, Jenny, what are we gonna do? She said, there's only one thing we can do, Laura. And I said, what? She said, we might as well dance. 
<laughs> That's what we did. We danced around for half an hour to Hebrew music. <laughs> and then the radio went off, and it was silent, and we carried on through the night. And the next day, at around 11 o'clock in the morning, our Irish skipper climbed the mast and he said the most beautiful words I've ever heard after It's a Girl. He said, Land Ahoy. And there in the distance was Gaza, coming out of the mist in the Mediterranean Sea. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And as we got closer, there were dots in the distance and we peered and we looked and we said to each other, what are the dots? And as we got closer, we realised they were people. Thousands of Palestinian people had slept on the beaches, unable to believe that after 63 years, no, 44 years, boats were finally coming from the outside world that weren't an enemy. They'd slept on the beaches. And we got a bit closer, and then a wall of sound hit us. And the sound was, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. And everybody was cheering, and children were in the sea, and little boys were climbing up, and grown men were crying and sobbing, and everyone was shouting, Allah Akbar, it was the greatest day of my life. Now, three days later, I was supposed to leave Gaza and go back to my children, and to this day I can't tell you why I didn't get on the boat. I have no explanation for you as a mother. I have no explanation for you as a wife. But I watched those boats leave, and I didn't know how I was going to get home. I tried three days later to go to the Rafa crossing with Egypt with my um, British passport to uh, see if I could get home. And the Mubarak regime guard looked at it like this and said, So you're Laura Booth. You're not going anywhere. Go back to Gaza. I said, What do you mean? This is a, you're open to let internationals leave. You've made an announcement. I'm an international. I'm leaving. He said, No, you're not. The Israelis want you to stay. The Israelis have said, If Laura Booth likes the Palestinians, let her live like them. So go back to Gaza. This place is closed to you. I'm telling you, it was like being in an elevator on the hundredth floor and you go down to the first and the second. I'd lost my family. I was under siege. I was, I was Palestinian. And you know what? I thank God every day of my life that that happened. Because I got to spend an entire month with the best Muslims alive in the Ummah today. <coughs> and you know what month it was, brothers and sisters? It was Ramadan. I was in Gaza, me, in Gaza, for 30 days in Ramadan. I learned so much. I learned, I learned how to be a human being that month. I remember one night I was invited to a family's house for iftar for the evening meal and I was taking some bags of meat with me and I knocked on the door and it was in a place called Rafa. Do you remember I mentioned Rafa at the beginning? I knocked on the door and the mother answered it like this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, fadal, which means welcome, welcome. I was astounded because this lady was without doubt the happiest woman I'd ever met. I mean, sisters, I love you all for the sake of Allah, but with all that you have here in the Bay Area of San Francisco, you can't give me a smile that she gave. Not even, not even one of the lights. She had light coming out of her skin, light coming out of her eyes. It was a joy just to look at her. And I was confused because I was in a refugee camp where it was more bullets than cement. And I thought, maybe she's rich. Maybe they've got a stash of gold in there. Maybe inside that doorway is Aladdin's cave. Because it's not possible to be this poor 
and that happy. And I walked round her, and what did I walk into? I walked into a cement room with nothing in it at all. An empty cement room with a rug on the floor. And the only other thing in that cement room were six or seven double mattresses around the walls, stained and ancient, that would be pulled down that night for dozens of children and adults to sleep on in that room. And I felt angry. It was the first time since working in the Muslim community I felt really angry at the idea of Islam. I didn't understand why people were fasting. Why there was poverty in Gaza and in the summer they couldn't drink because their God said don't drink. I was furious. I'd had enough. I was sick of it. I said to this mother of Rafa, tell me why you fast in Ramadan. You say your God loves you, so he asks you to do without water for 30 days. But you know that your water is dirty every day. So what? You say your God loves you, so he asks you to do without food for 30 days. But you're hungry 365 days a year. So what's the fast for? Go on, tell me. Tell me why you fast. And she looked at me. And she said, I fast to remember the poor. SubhanAllah. She was fasting with nothing in her stomach and nothing of dunya to remember other people who were poorer than she was. At that moment, a key went into my heart and I thought, if this is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this acceptance of your fate and happiness with it is Islam, I want to be a Muslim. If this humility before God is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this love of your fellow man is Islam, yes, I want to be Muslim. But you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us time and time again in the Quran the forgetful. How many times in the Quran do we read, O oh, mankind, you forget. I give you these signs, I send prophets and messengers, and you forget. And when that lady said, Salam alaikum, and shut the door, I forgot that feeling. And I forgot about Allah. But you know what, brothers and sisters? Allah never forgot about me. I went back to sinning. And Allah still forgave me. Imagine that. He still forgives you no matter how far you go in your behaviours. That is our Rahman ar Rahim. Allah. 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 I got out of Gaza after 30 days and I went back to my family, changed forever. But I still wasn't going to be Muslim. I loved the people dearly now, and I loved the Gazan people and the Palestinians as my brothers and sisters, but faith, bowing, praying, giving things up, nah, it wasn't going to happen. I was stubborn. Stubborn and arrogant, both words used in the Quran to describe various states of the heart. I had that heart. But in 2010, I got another nudge, and it was Al Quds Day. There was a rally happening, and it was for Jerusalem. And it was calling for the freedom of the Palestinian people and the freedom of access for Muslims to go and worship at Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the third most holy place in Islam. And I wanted to cover it for my, um, for my news channel. So I went and I covered the march, and then afterwards, a friend and I were driving, and guess what month it was? Ramadan. And as we were driving, we were going on a day out, and the Adhan went for Maghrib, just as we passed a beautiful mosque. My friend said, I should go in and pray. I said, I'll come with you. And at this time, I didn't just go into the mosque, I did wudu fully before I went in. 
And when I went inside, I made my first sincere, full prayer to Allah. And it was this. I said, Dear Allah, I didn't know Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Dear Allah, I don't ask you for anything today because you have already given me a perfect life. I have a great life, thank you. But please, please, please bless Palestine and help the people. And then I sat down. Now I sat down as a tourist. I just wanted to watch the other mums feed the kids. I was nosy. These women were Muslim women in Ramadan. I was curious, but that's not what happened. When I sat down, as soon as my body touched the floor, I was in a place of such bliss and peace as you've never felt. It was like sitting beneath a waterfall of tranquility. Such, such calm came over me that I forgot who I was. After a while, I didn't actually remember my name. And I sat looking at my feet, thinking, this is so beautiful. And the feeling just kept growing and growing. And I was just a tiny particle in a feeling of peace that was universal. Now at some point, some young women came over and they sat around me in a circle. And I don't know why this happened, but this young woman who I'd never seen before, she was around 21 years old, reached over and put her hands on my shoulders and she said, I love you. And I said, I love you too. And I thought that my heart was going to burst because I felt like she was my aunt and I was her mother and she was my grandmother and that every relationship that women can have, we were having. And I realized, I realized that I was no longer a tourist to the Muslim world, that I was inside the Ummah. I was being allowed to feel the love that passes around the Muslim Ummah every minute, every day of every year. After a while, my friend said, why don't we go to our hotel? And I said, I want to sleep here tonight on the floor. She's a lovely girl, and she said, okay, my mother and I will stay with you. And I slept the night on the floor of the mosque. And in the morning, I prayed Fajr. And seven days later, back in London, I walked into a masjid, and I heard myself say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And I became Muslim. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. And that's my story, and every day since has been a blessing or a test, but above all I want to share with you today a sense of gratitude. I want us all to remember to say Alhamdulillah for this beautiful, beautiful life that we've been given with all its tests and hardships, because whatever it is here, it's not Gaza. They have a very difficult test. And ours, we are the weak ones, it's light for us. I want to share one more thing with you. I went back to Gaza as a Muslim last April. And I went to a place called Beit Hanun. Now Beit Hanun used to be a beautiful farming village on the end of Gaza. The outskirts of Gaza. And now, it's not. It's Israel's buffer zone. It's stolen land where they send their tanks to go and commit massacres regularly on the people of Gaza. But people live in this buffer zone. They have, they have, they have cement block flats full of children. You, you say, assalamu alaikum, in every window, they have 20 children saying, alaikum salam, and around the children are bullet holes and shell holes. And I went to visit a family there. And the family were living in nothing more than a garage, and there were 15 children and two mothers and a father in terrible circumstances. Now, when we introduce our children to, to somebody new, we say their name, and then we probably boast about them a bit, right? 
So when I talk about Alex, I'll say, this is Alex, she's my eldest daughter, and she is so good at math, she's going to be a scientist. And I will say, this is Holly, she's very naughty, but she has a lovely voice. They don't have the chance to do that in Gaza anymore. They introduce their children by their name and their injuries. And this family was no different. I saw a little boy running around. He uh, looked about four, but he was six. They have mal malnutrition. And she said, oh, this is Yusuf, come here. She said, look at his leg. And it had white pock marks all down it, a scar tissue. And it, because it had been damaged by white phosphorus. White phosphorus that Israel rained on Gaza 2009. What is white phosphorus? It's napalm with cancer. They rained napalm on the most densely populated civilian area on Earth. And this little boy will probably get cancer as a result. He's horribly scarred. Then she called me to her big son, 16, very tall, and she said, look at his leg. He rolled up his jeans, and there was a huge scar, fresh scar down it. I thought I was going to throw up. It was, uh, he'd been shot by an Israeli sniper outside his home. They just take pot shots. Pew, pew, pew. At children. And then she showed me two of her daughters, aged eight and ten, and they just do this and they don't talk anymore because they've been so traumatized by the shelling. And I'd had enough and I went to a back room to pray Maghreb. And in the final sujud, I had my head to the ground, I started to cry. And I cried and I cried and I cried. And I understood at that moment how in the Quran it describes how Jacob, Jacob, almost went blind with tears of grief, and I thought, yes, because I can't believe how hard and how fast these tears are coming. You could go blind crying. And as I was there, and it was dark, one of the mothers came in, and she looked at me and said, are you okay? Why are you crying? And I said, because I hate this. I hate this for you. I hate that your children are going to keep on getting injured by Israel. I hate that you're going to keep living in poverty. I hate that the world knows this is going on and they don't do anything. And I hate that I'm here and I can't even help you. I hate it. And she said to me, you're crying for us, but we're so happy. We have Allah. And Allah loves us. And if we are patient and steadfast, Allah has promised us Jannah. Alhamdulillah, Yana. Now, let us all just remember to say Alhamdulillah, and we'll end with the da'a, Ya Allah, make us grateful. Thank you for all the reminders that you give for gathering us here. Ya Allah, we remember our brothers and sisters in Surya and their bravery. Make them brave. Ya Allah, protect them and give them time. May Allah protect the people of Gaza and all of Palestine and make them steadfast and forgive us all our sins. Ami, forgive me if I've made any mistakes. <laughs>